So we are in First Corinthians. So you know, I thought to myself, self, what is true success? So most people would say, well, performance, popularity, and possessions. That's one way of looking at success. Check off and remind us one would need to be a God to know what is success in this life. Right? I mean, if you're if you're looking at that, then how much of that do you need? And so Chekhov says, no, really, you got to be God. He said it another way. He said one must be a God to be able to tell success from failures without making a mistake. So how do we measure success? Well, let me tell you how the church oftentimes measures it. It's uh, buildings, budgets, and baptisms. Right? I mean, that tends to be how we look at, oh, we're successful. Or the ABCs, attendance, buildings, and cash. And this, this is not a good measuring stick for um, what is truly successful. It seems to me success would be that we are faithful to obey what the Word of God says. Right? That doesn't seem to make more sense. Uh, Calican, he was a famous church historian, he said, and you've heard this, right? Tradition is the living faith of the dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. So we want good traditions. But traditionalism can become somewhat problematic. So there's a danger that can come about in most any church. And it can happen here. I hope it doesn't. Desiring to be socially relevant, we become less than fully biblically and spiritually accurate. Or we must be both culturally relevant and biblically. Now, you say that's a no-brainer, but most churches sometimes capitulate to be careful to not offend the culture. So we were driving here this morning, and um, we don't usually listen to the radio. For some reason, Marsha turned it on. I guess she thought I was going to be boring this morning, so she wanted to go, Jeff, is on. And he's sitting here basically yelling at the people about he's in the book of Acts, and he's talking to them about how... The church needs to understand that it's under attack against the First Amendment by forces in the government. And he's kind of waxing on. Of course, people are applauding. Um, but he is trying to speak to the day of issues of the day. And I think that's good. Now, some people say, well, we really shouldn't talk about politics. I'm not sure why not. Uh, sometimes we have um, things that are political, but they usually are theological, right? The politics usually involves ethics, and ethics always involves theology. So it seems to me that we need to realize that uh, living in the culture we live in, it's not what we grew up in, it's not what we were used to, it's a different world, and we need to re realize who it is we're really supposed to fear. So the fear that ends all fear, the fear of God, drives out all other we're living in a world that's hostile to us. They believe in a worldview that is totally antithetical to us. They have created from that atheistic worldview a paganistic mindset, a culture that is totally corrupt, contaminated, perverted. That's the world we live in. We didn't used to live in this. So we've got to make sure we don't get into the culture. We don't. We need to make sure we're not a frog in the kettle, right? And unaware of what's cooking us. Uh, we need to understand the fear of the Lord. The Proverbs would tell us that that's uh, a very important thing to do. So if you keep that as your first priority, the Lord, then all of a sudden everything else come, comes into focus, doesn't it? Now, John Calvin was a very smart man, and he said, Men are never duly touched and impressed with the conviction of their insignificance until they have contrasted themselves with the majesty of God. We need to keep God in front of us. We need to keep the biblical portrait, the biblical picture of the triune God there in front of us. Because when you see him, then you aren't really going to fear. And you're able to have a word for the culture. Now, I'm not saying that Jeffers is doing the right thing or in the right way. That's up for you to decide. But he is trying to speak to the day. And unfortunately, so often, um, pastors don't speak to the issue of the day. 
Uh, I had a, a friend of mine who is in a Baptist church in Arizona called up and was chatting about stuff, and he was frustrated because his pastor never speaks about anything of the day. He just kind of continues on in Ezekiel, not even mentioning anything of what's going on. And he's a little frustrated. So we need to be relevant culturally, but we need to be biblically accurate all the time. Now, we're in the book of 1 Corinthians, and Paul has just talked about a topic that the church doesn't usually do, church discipline. Or if it doesn't, it doesn't do it in a biblical way. So either it does it wrong or it doesn't do it at all, and the result is the church is unhealthy. Well, the church of Corinth was very unhealthy. Paul says, do I need to come to you with a rod? And then he starts talking about judgment. And then he starts talking about, I've already judged this guy because he's sleeping with his stepfather and father's wife, which would be his stepmother. This is a sin that you can go on in the pagan world. And you simply put up with it instead of judging this, this sinful person who's a brother. He's named a brother. So Paul's a little bit frustrated. So we talked a little bit about that. Before we jump back into that, um, Obviously, a, a topic that uh, you may have been familiar with is what is called the doctrine of separation. Familiar with that? The doctrine of separation. So I've given you a handout called The Principle and Practice of Separation. And I'm not going to go through that. You can go through it if you want, look up some verses or whatever. But the bottom line is the Bible, Old and New Testament, has always talked about the fact that sometimes God's people, Old Testament saint, Christian church, God's people sometimes do things that call for us to shame them, shun them, maybe even separate from them. Now, once again, most churches don't do this because they're afraid of being sued, they're afraid of something happening, so they just kind of, they don't talk about it, they don't act on it, they say, well, we're praying about it, they don't do anything. So, separation is basically two parts. First degree, I separate from a believer who's in sin and will not stop. So I'm separating from Mason because he's doing X and he won't stop. Yeah. But then there's second degree separation. I separate from you if you will not separate from Mason. So we won't use Gail, Arnie. Yeah. <laughs> Arnie. Okay, so he's in sin, I have to separate from him. But you won't separate from him, therefore I have to separate from him. Oh, right? So second degree. You familiar with this? You've heard of this. This goes on in the Midwest. In the old days, uh, a lot of this took place. Certain, some churches uh, do this on a regular basis. Uh, I know a guy, he's a pastor in Minnesota. <clears throat> he, he didn't agree with a certain doctrinal position that I had, and so he totally cut me off. Okay. It wasn't an essential issue, but to him it was. And um, I never forget, I went, I was meeting with uh, Mark Bailey. Mark Bailey was president of Dallas Seminary for you know, 15, 17 years. And uh, we were talking, and I said, you know, Mark, I remember learning about these separationists and legalists in school, but I'd never met one. But now I have. And they're not very nice. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, and guess what? I have to go raise money from them. <laughs> <laughs> so I go, ooh, yeah, that would have been good. That been good. So separationism is a, is a very um, prevalent thing in certain parts of our country and certain types of churches. Um, you don't really hear too much of it around here. But let me give an illustration of this. Now, what would you do? What should we do? So. President Obama is a Christian. He says he's a Christian. I know his name sounds Muslim. I know some people think he's a Muslim, and maybe he is a Muslim, but he says he's a Christian. He used to go to a Christian church, Reverend Wright. Uh, again, that's not my kind of church. But he says he's a Christian. He goes to a Christian church, so he walks like a duck, he quacks like a duck. It's a duck, so we're going to go with that. Okay. So we just grant me that. So, <clears throat> Senator Obama put up some legislation for what is called partial birth abortion. And when he became president, he wanted to push that at a federal level. So this is where basically um, the 
woman is having the baby, delivering. The baby is out of the birth canal and almost fully out of the woman's body. And then the doctor or the midwife or the whatever kills the baby on purpose. Now, I don't know about you, but I mean, I'm not exactly sure how that doesn't constitute murder, right? right? I mean, it's just like, I mean, if you just don't want to see it, you don't see it, but that's really, that's going to be a very hard thing to stand before Jesus for. At any rate, that's what he articulated and wanted legislatively, what he wanted in the way he thought for a woman's freedom, reproduction rights, and whatever. Okay, so now what do I do? I'm a Christian, he's a Christian. Am I supposed to separate from him because that's a sin of a, of a large magnitude? And he's not going to deal with it. So I separate from him. Okay. That would seem to indicate <clears throat> that I actually can't vote for him. Right? Yeah. Now, some would say, no, it doesn't. But I, I would say it does. But, but that's, that's kind of the issue here. So that would be first degree separation. And I would enact that by either not seeing him or by not voting for him. Because I, I personally couldn't vote for somebody who wants to legislate murder at, at a, such a high level. And it's not meant to be a one issue voting thing. I get that. But I mean, this is kind of a unique voting thing. Okay. However, let's go to the second degree. So <clears throat> Mason says, oh, no, that's okay. He's a good guy. I'm going to vote for him. And this is like, <laughs> so, am I supposed to separate from Mason, second degree, because of what he's advocating and validating and affirming and voting for? You know what I'm saying? Second degree. So that's kind of abstract. Well, no, not really. I mean, that, that can be real. So, that's how this kind of plays itself out on the political, but it is theological. And it is ethical, and trust me, if you want to blow a church up, this is how you do it. Mm. Not being clear on how this is to operate. I'm not saying this or this. I mean, I, my, I mean you got to deal with this. Otherwise, people go underground. They say, well, we just won't talk about it. They go underground. They get in trouble or whatever. That's why pastors need to be theologians and ethicists to be able to speak to the issue. That's why that's so in that situation, wouldn't your first responsibility be to approach me and, and talk about that and try to oh, yeah. me back over to, that, to the truth before they yeah, the, pro the process would be, yeah, I told you, I, I try to convince you, I said, read this, let's talk about this, blah, blah, blah. Absolutely. But in the day, it's no, fine. Then I have to make a decision. Now, you can, you can imagine what that could look like in the church. It's not a uniformly X party. Uh, this is this is a very difficult thing. This is why the church doesn't deal with it. Because it's hard. You know, we had the same issue in a church in San Antonio, and the biggest argument against the separation was members of the church said, Well, if we separate from him, who's going to share the truth with him? Who's going to befriend him? Who's going to bring him back? He'll do what we're throwing them out to the world. And leaving them there with having no influence in his life. Except that's so exactly they didn't want to did. He right. threw them out into the world. He put them out to Satan, which would be an economy of the idea of the world. That's what he did. Now, that was after they went, they pleaded, they taught, they asked questions, I'm sure. But he wouldn't listen. And so Paul says, I, for myself, I've already, even though I'm not with you, absent, I'm there in spirit, I have already put them out in the church. I've already delivered them. So they probably tried a lot, or Paul tried a lot. They wouldn't listen. Paul says, next step. Yeah. Isn't that the model of today? What is about the politics of today? If you, if, I don't, if you don't agree with me and I don't agree with you, we throw you out and then we throw all your friends out. Well, right. And and I'm not against throwing out. It's just a matter of you got to do it the right way. Well, my concern is saying, that's the model of the current culture. Yeah. Yeah. My concern is a church doesn't know what to do, right? so they don't do anything, and that's not a positive thing for the church. Yeah. It, it's a real difficult thing. This is going to become more and more relevant as the culture goes down, the church has got to respond. Oh, goodness. Okay, so your next handout, what it means to be a mature Christian. Y'all got that one? Okay. 
So let's see. Here's the Apostle Paul. Let me read our passage this morning. <laughs> But does anybody want to throw anything in yet? <laughs> yeah, I'll throw it. I'll throw it. It's not an important topic. What about heresy within the church? Well, the same yeah. way, Paul makes it real clear in Titus. He says, reject a factious man. The word factious there is the word heretic, the divider. Reject a factious man after you've warned him twice, knowing that he is self absorbed different denominations within Christianity. We would say there are some heretical positions in some of those denominations. How should we be relating with the church of the street? <laughs> the Rainbow Church. Well, <laughs> Good one. Um, the Rainbow Church, that one or others, yeah, have views that are heretical to our thinking. They're unbiblical, they're anti-biblical, and they're immoral. So I don't go there. I don't visit there, I don't go there, I don't hang around with people there. So I'm but I don't have to do anything. I don't have to make an official statement. Right. I'm not, you know, our church is against that church, but I don't, I don't know that. But, but there, yeah, but for the different denominations, we can say that some of the different um the Baptists are baptized to say. There are some Church of Christ people who say in Acts 38, Mark 16, that you have to be baptized to be saved. We would say there's a nice Catholic church down there you can go to and find that over there, but it's not really part of the Reformation. It's not really part of what the Bible actually says. So the question is how do we deal with them? Uh, not only to the big churches, but people within the church, in that church, and my thought, and I'll finish where I was going. We talked about separating, but I don't think we said you never speak to them. If they come, yes, you speak to them. But if they want to be united back to our fellowship, to our fellowship, they have to repent and change. Yeah, if they're going to become part of this church, they're not going to. That's not going to happen without them clarifying some views, especially for membership of this church. But those who have been put out doesn't. We cut them off from any communication that we see them. We cross the street to the other side because we're not going to speak to them. We'll see, still speak. Some people would say Titus in Second Thessalonians when it says shun them, have nothing to do with them, not even a meal. Some would say you don't see them, you don't talk with them, you walk across the street. Others would say. You don't let them back into your church, and they certainly are going to partake of the Lord's Supper as long as they're doing that. So one is not as, as severe in its repercussions as the other. And so you have to decide how you want to deal with it. And not everybody's going to agree on this. Well, and then the other thing that I, I'm i kind of coming to know a little bit, I'm just kind of going on what he was talking about. And salvation, do they believe you're saved? When you believe in Jesus, or do you believe, like for example, the Catholic Church? There are some people that I know that are Catholic that truly believe that you're saved, once saved, always saved. But then there's other people that I know that are Catholic that don't believe that. So then you've got this, you know, thing yeah. going on within the church, you know, different denominations too. So so the good news is there are a lot of Catholics who believe a lot of dumb stuff, but they believe some of the right stuff, and they're going to go to heaven. And that might be true of all of us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the question is, how much heresy do you have? Ten percent, twenty percent. You know, um, these are difficult things, and this is why, unfortunately, churches don't really think through this because it's hard and it becomes problematic, and you don't want to offend people. You don't want people think you're mad. That's what happened with this whole political thing, right? The whole political thing was going on in our church. It was. It was. Uh, it was a big deal, right? It was a big deal. Now, for clarification, will you define heresy? The word heretic or heresy is the word, it means division. The Greek word is heresy. Okay. So <coughs> we just kind of brought it over into English. It just means a divider, factious, right? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, it's good that there are heresies among you, that those who are approved might be made manifest. Paul says in Titus that, you know, rejecting heretic after two warnings, knowing that he's a self-absorbed man. 
So it's simply somebody who comes into church or is in the church and is dividing the church at a doctrinal level. Okay. Now, when we use the word heretic, we usually bring in kind of a cultural idea. The heretic, the non-believing, wicked, evil, blah, blah. That's not what historically a heretic has been. A heretic is somebody who's inside the church who believes something that the church doesn't historically used to believe. They're an insider. But by that, you mean it's outside of orthodoxy? Yeah, outside of the orthodox. Like to, to make it clear, you have a Calvinist, you have an Arminian, and you have a free race. They don't all believe the same thing, but they're all within orthodox. Right. So that wouldn't be heresy. Correct. Could it be heresy if somebody was trying to divide the church over the issue? Or would yeah. it not be heresy if you something it, it, it could be that a person doing that action is trying to divide the church, and therefore you technically say you're a heretic if you're trying to divide the church. But see, we brought in the word heresy or heretic kind of in a, a more modern way, right? And, and I'm using it in the biblical way, a historical way. <laughs> so the heretics were all insiders. They were inside the church dividing it. That's why they looked at Martin Luther <clears throat> as a heretic. Today in Facebook, believe it or not. And I look for the good in what people are. Because the bad will manifest itself. And I rebuke those who are condemning individuals for doing that. Because again, God's end of the story. And there will be unity in the future at some point. This is not the church. So, because arguing usually doesn't uh, give fruit, but having good discussion. On what we have in common and whatever is good, and and professing and encouraging people, this is a biblical belief in like the Godhead uh, debate. So. so this is why our church and lots of churches have been. This is why our church has a doctrinal state because we're saying this is what we agree to, this is what we believe. Now, some people want a bigger doctrinal statement, some people want a smaller doctrinal statement. I'm not saying which is right or wrong. I prefer a larger doctrinal statement to make it clear on a number of things that need to be clear. And others say, no, let's have some more budget. Fine, no problem. But if you don't have a doctrinal statement, then you don't know what you're talking about, right? And then with the doctrinal statement, like Jace is going to go through our doctrinal statement, right? In a few months, he's going to teach through the doctrinal statement. Good. And everybody ought to get a copy and read through it once a year. Just say, yep, I, I still believe that. Yep, I still believe that. So I'm glad he's going to do that. I think it's a great thing to do. But you've got to have a baseline so that you see, this is what we believe. At least it's not everything, but this is what we believe. And therefore, if you see a heretic, you're able to spot them. And then you shun them, put them out if they are creating heresy, if they're creating division. I don't think so. Ooh. Okay, so... <clears throat> Is that what you were looking for? Somebody to shoot at you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's all recorded. No problem. <laughs> Alan's here. Go ahead, all these dogs. It's all good. So let me read this passage if we get in more trouble. <clears throat> we're in chapter 6. Does anyone of you, when he has a case against his neighbor, dare to go to law before the unrighteous? Notice the article. The unrighteous. And not before the saints. Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is judged by you, are you not competent to constitute the smallest law courts? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more matters of this life? If then you have a law courts dealing with matters of this life, do you appoint them as judges? Who are of no account in the church? I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not among you one wise man who will be able to describe, to decide between his brothers? But brother goes to law with brother, and that before unbelievers. Actually, then, it's already a defeat for you that you have lawsuits with one another. Why not rather be wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? On the contrary, you yourselves wrong and defraud, and that your brothers. Oh, that's pretty harsh. Now, what's interesting 
is that Paul uses the word judge and judgment actually nine times. I think that's part of what's going on, right? There's some sort of a judgment taking place. And Paul says, I'm saying this to your shame. It's the word we get entropy from. Disorder. Right? Disintegration. Uh, declining. He's saying, you guys are declining. You guys are just disorderly. You guys are a wreck. So, what's going on here? So, here's the problem. The church of Jesus in the courts of the pagans. Okay? Now, in this day, uh, you had law courts, and some rich Christians would take advantage of not rich Christians, and they'd take them to court. They'd slap a suit on them. They'd do all sorts of things to kind of harm them and take advantage of them. James in his book talks about the, the wealthy taking advantage of the poor and not paying what they should pay them, and talks about court. Here, Paul's saying, you guys are running to court taking advantage of your brothers and sisters in, in the church. And Paul's not really happy about that. <coughs> so he speaks to them about why are you going to the unrighteous? You're the righteous. Why are you going to the unrighteous to solve your problems? Don't you know, verse 2, that the saints will judge the world? Oh, what, what, how's that going to be? Well, Revelation 2.26 talks about the fact that we are going to be given the right to rule in the kingdom with Jesus. There's coming a new world order called the kingdom of God. It's not here yet, but it's coming. And when it comes, Jesus will be ruling and reigning from Jerusalem over all of the globe. The minus is probably even bigger than the earth. But in that is a We are going to rule with them. Is that fantastic? Yeah. Are all believers going to rule with Well, it seems to me that we will go to the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ, and the Lord will evaluate our life and He will reward us according to what we have done. That reward will be manifested in some shape, some form, in ruling with Him in the kingdom. So my guess is everybody will be, well, I know that every, everyone will be in the kingdom. My guess is everybody will have a role, but some will have a different role, right? The apostles will have a very unique role. They're going to be the 12 gates of Israel. Is that interesting? Um, so, yeah, there, there is a stratification. We'll put it that way. But we're going to rule the world. And you want to go to court with these pagans? I say this to your shame, Paul says. He says, <clears throat> and if the world is judged by you, are you not competent to constitute the, the smallest law courts? So you're going to rule the world, but you can't deal in the world? Paul's saying, this is silly. He goes one step farther, verse 3. Do you not know that we shall judge angels? Hmm. Well, I'm going to judge the world. I'm going to judge angels. What in the world does this mean? How can that possibly be? Well, um, we have another page. Saints judging angels. The gal we got the staple on, so that's it. But uh, so pull that one up. Saints judging angels. So what in the world does that mean? So the apostle has just delivered a stinging rebuke to the believers in Corinth. The reason is their division and selfishness and their ability to allow immorality in the church. That was the problem. Now Paul addresses the problem of Christians going to court before non-Christians. Paul shames them because instead of going to the world for judgment between Christians, the church will judge the world. Paul doubles down and adds that we're to judge the angels. Paul is using an argument from the greater to the lesser. If they will one day judge the world and the angels, shouldn't they be capable of handling relatively minor disputes among themselves? Remember, this is the group that thought they were so wise. Remember chapter one, they thought they were so wise. They were so able. They're so great. And Paul's going, what's wrong with you people? You got a problem. So what does this mean to judge the angels? So here are some options. 
One is that there's a judgment by example. The faith of the believer in the church will condemn the world by example. Okay, that's possible. Second option, judgment by proxy. This view is favored by some contemporary commentators like Anthony Thistleton. He says, quote, it emphasizes Paul's teaching on the believer's union with Christ, just as we share in his death, so we we'll also share in his resurrection power and authority. <laughs> Thus, we can say when Christ returns to judge the world, we who trust him will also share in this judgment. In the derivative sense that we participate spiritually in all the saving acts, since he is our federal head acting on our behalf. So because he's going to judge and we're in him, therefore there's kind of a derivative factor we get to do it too with him. I think that's fine. Judgment by delegated authority. Believers will have an active delegated role for believers in the final judgment. In the Old Testament, believers have a role in the final judgment. Daniel talks about this. And judgment was given to the, for the saints of the Most High. And the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Jesus spoke about truly, I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on the glorious throne, you will have followed me. You who have followed me will sit on the 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So, this idea of we're really going to judge, that's probably true. So, now none of these talk about angels, but there are some passages that speak about angels. But let me turn the page over. Here's a fourth one. Now, this is a view from a guy named Oscar Kuhlmann. He was a German uh, theologian back in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, he, would, he would not be called an evangelical, but back then, he was fine. He was a nice guy. But this view today is held also by Michael Heiser. Unfortunately, Michael Heiser has pancreatic cancer. He had prayed for him this morning. As a matter of fact, that God would give him many years to live and write because he lives, as he lives, he writes some wonderful things. But in his book, The Unseen Realm, anybody ever heard of this? The Unseen Realm? Fascinating. Uh, God had temporarily allotted jurisdiction of the pagan nations to a ruling class of angels known as the sons of God in the Old Testament. In other words, the sons of God were ruling the earth. That was their job. They sinned. There, some of them are in judgment now in the, in the dark, according to Jude. Some will be judged later, and we're going to judge them with Jesus. Interesting idea. See, when, it, when John says the whole world lies in the lap of the evil one, do you understand that's true? <laughs> you wonder why governments run amok? You wonder why people like Stalin, Hitler, Pol Pot, and others exist? They're divine. You understand what's happening in America? We are giving over to the demonic influence. What do you think homosexuality is? All the perversion of transgender murder. What looks going on? The angelic host are influencing rulers of this world. We're in a spiritual battle. That's what Paul says. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities. The whole world actually does lie in the lap of the this is not, this is my father's book. That's not this. There's a war going on. And one day, we will lose. The church will be raptured, taken. The tribulation will take place. And then the kingdom will come and will come back. And we will judge the angels. And we will rule the world. <clears throat> but not today. You say, well, you mean that's why things are so messed up? Yes. And the church is not responding very well to the culture. We lost the culture. Don't you think the actual world view, at least the jury and I were talking about this, that people think, people, even Christians think this way sometimes, that we're born good, that we're really born, we're born good, we're good human beings, we're, we think about other people, we're good. That's just a lie. From the pit of hell. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know I wasn't born good. So, the doctrine of total depravity, right? not the doctrine of total inability, right. but the doctrine of total depravity. And so, yeah, we are sinful, right? Now, some people would say, when I'm born, I have the guilt of Adam's sin. I personally don't think that's true. Uh, I don't think I have Adam's guilt. 
I do have a death sentence and I do have a sin nature. And I will sin. About five days after I was born, I suppose, or whenever that day was. I will sin. I do sin. Everybody does. But I don't have the guilt of Adam, but I have the death sentence that Adam had and he passed it on to me. But we're all born in that situation. And no, I wasn't born good. I wasn't born a wonderful good person. At least not. But there are some people who think that. And um, they need that because it gives them a sociological platform. And so if that's all true, then all you need is what? More money. More education. Right. A little change. Oh, everybody got that spark of divinity within, the brotherhood of man and the spark of divinity within from God. And we can we can give enough money and enough education and enough peace score and everything will be fine. That's what that the DAs are teaching. His district attorneys believe that. So many of them. Would you explain uh, that paragraph? This kind of court Deuteronomy says that the most I gave to the nation their inheritance. We need to back to that to fix the wrongs of people according to the number of the sons of God. What are we saying that fix the sons of God? Are we saying Kaiser is saying there was a divine council where the sons of God who were angels, God brought them up. So think of Job. Yes. And there was a day when, right, the sons of God gathered with God and Satan was there also. Remember in that discussion? Kaiser would say that was the council meeting with the angelic host. See, I think you would say the earth was created actually for angels to live on. They messed it up. They were judged. And that's why the world was tohu babohu, formless and void, because of a sin of the angelic host that messed up creation. God is in the process of redoing everything through man who represent him to rule and reign. Now, one of the things I was taught was that. There was one, one believer or one fallen angel. And when that equals, that's when the end will come. In other words, the believer or not his angel, fallen angel will be in hell. That's not at all what we're talking about here. That is not only not at all what we're talking about. <laughs> I've never ever heard of that. <laughs> and that doesn't mean it's not somebody's idea. I don't think I've ever heard that. Okay. I never found it in the world. So well, that's, just... that's generally the problem. <laughs> 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 it ain't there. Uh, uh, so the reason I was at the very bottom, if Paul had this view in mind, then we can see the tragic irony in the behavior of the Corinthian believers. They would one day judge the very heavenly powers behind their earthly rulers. So why would they appeal to these same earthly rulers to judge their affairs? Right? Paul says, I can't believe you people. You don't understand. But you know what the problem here was? They didn't understand theology. Paul's attempting to teach them some theology. So when we read his letter, we're trying to understand the theology that Paul is teaching. That's why we need biblical exposition, right, through the books of the Bible. That's why we synthesize and collect all of it to put it together in biblical theology. And then we convert that into, so what? How does that apply? And what's the ethical implication? That's what the church is supposed to do. That's what the pastors are supposed to do. They are supposed to say, look at our world. There's earthquakes cracking all over the place, and there's fissures breaking this thing apart. And the pastor is to come in theologically and say, let me help you understand what has happened. Let me help you understand why the cracks and the fissures are coming about. And let me help you understand the foundation that can survive that. That's what we do. We're not here to entertain. So, uh, stop me if you don't want me to continue. <laughs> um, but I had the pleasure of meeting a congresswoman at Bachman last Sunday. And she had a, uh, I love her, I love her prayers. If you, if you ever want to get on what's her prayer list, what's her prayer name? Michelle Bachman. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I love her. She's just 
sweetheart. Mm -hmm. But um, she had a gentleman come. Um, I do this class, it's an ethics class um, on Sunday nights at First Dallas. And she had a gentleman named Bill Conan come. And uh, a lot of it is, you know, political, uh, that kind of stuff. And so um, they were talking about why Trump lost. And there's all these, you know, conspiracy theories and all the things, blah, blah, blah. Um, well, what was interesting is they brought forth um, what they believe really happened. And it goes along with everything you're talking about, how important it is to be in scripture and to be have, make sure the church is together. So on January 27, 2000, Jerry Kushner, Trump's son-in-law, um, do you remember what he did with Netanyahu? Uh-huh. Yeah, what did he do? They did a peace treaty. With, they yeah. were trying to stop yeah. Palestine. Yeah. And you can kind of, I mean, you can go up in there. What does the Bible say about what they were doing is they were re-annexing Israel. And what does the Bible say about that? <coughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, it's always dangerous to understand biblical prophecy from the newspaper. Mm -hmm. um, we may be right around the corner from the rapture and then the tribulation. Or this may be one more significant cycle before the rapture happens in 100 years. Mm -hmm. right? And usually, for those of us who are interested in that topic, <clears throat> Israel plays a very important role. And so the question is, what's going on in Israel? Well, there are a bunch of atheistic pagans who are in a war zone. Uh, they aren't thinking about the illogical side of it as Christians are. I don't know what's going to happen. I, I think, uh, Israel, I mean, I know Israel will survive, but I don't know that that means, oh, great, the rapture is almost I don't know it is, but I don't, I don't know that it is. <clears throat> but given the issues in Israel, given the issues with Islam today, given the issues of America is basically being taken down from inside, that to me says, oh yes, this points me to say, this is actually probably closer than I've ever thought in my life. Again, that doesn't mean tomorrow or next year, but I can certainly see within 10 years, yeah, the church will have fallen apart and failed enough that it will come to remove the church. So, really? yeah, the church isn't going to do well. The Lord's going to come and remove the church because it's fallen away. He's going to remove the church. And then the tribulation, and we, we think about all the people dying during the tribulation. That's true. But do you know how many people are evangelized? Right? There's all kinds of evangelism that takes place. And then judgment also takes place upon both Israel and the rest of the world. Well, and several spiritual advisors and theologians went to Kushner and to um, President Trump. I can't remember his pastor or some woman that he worked to get up with. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't have we to go there. We, 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 we know. We know. We know. We know. We know. And all of these people said, do this, do this. Even though the Bible says, do not disperse the Jews. Do not divide the land. And it's very, very clear. And told them. And from that point on, all the things that happened in 2000 were a result of Jared Kushner's and, and even Netanyahu was Gideon. And so we've missed, you know, and that's the point of being in the word and that why it needs to come from the church. We need to be strong because look at all this devastation that happened in 2000 beyond the election. A lot. Yeah. Well, we are going to judge angels and that's going to be kind of interesting at that time. But these people, they didn't realize the significance of their role. Fred, uh, I have a maybe a minor question here, but um, when Paul is talking and addressing the Corinthians in chapter 6, is he telling them something that they should have already known, or is he now telling them what the facts are? In other words, that he'll be judging the case. Should they have known this already? Now, um, I'm thinking about our church and all the church I've attended that. Oh, they don't seem to know that. You know, were the Corinthians supposed to know that already? I think Paul may have thought they should have, but they obviously forgot. And to apply that here I mean, to today, yeah, that's why you have a doctrinal statement. That's why you teach in the doctrinal statement. And that's why you teach Bible exposition and theological material. Does this church's doctrinal statement say that he will judge me? I don't think so. 
Just check it. It does say we believe in a uh, great tribulation rapture, the millennial coming in Christ. Um, it does say we believe in the eternal conscious torment. But I don't think it has anything about the doctrine of reward and accountability. And most churches don't put that in their doctrinal statement. I think they should, but that's just me. So Paul says, I say this to your shame. Whoa, verse 5. Is there anybody here who can make that kind of decision? Obviously not. And so Paul's embarrassed by it. But instead, you go to the court with the unbeliever. So Paul, this is just a horrible thing. So, so now you're, you're already defeated, right? It's already defeated for you. You have lawsuits with one another. Why not be wrong? Why not be defrauded? On the contrary, you guys do the wrong and you do the defrauding. They're involved in this sin. So now, <clears throat> I don't have time to do everything I was going to do, but I can say this. Do you think Christians should ever sue a fellow Christian? Use the legal system to sue a believer. Many believers, many churches use this to say, Christians should never, can never sue Christians. Larry, not do so. Well, I think they probably could. They should sue them. Well, there are, there, there will be times where a Christian has done something sinful and awful and liable. You may have to sue them. I think Paul's saying that what changed God is about the word is more of a factor of the believers working out the same thing. Plus, it's a little bit of a matter of what God is not really any in the same way. So Larry says yes, Ed says no. What about a Christian who does something illegal and the only remedy to bring legality to it is to utilize a system called the civil system? I think sometimes we're forced to do that because of the sinful world we live in. Because we don't really want to do that. I mean, our, if we're living right and we're living for the Lord, but someone is really, like you just said, doing something that's totally illegal and wrong, and are we just going to let it fly and let it keep going? Are we going to stand up and do what's right? And unfortunately, I think sometimes the other person, the only way you're going <clears> to <throat> solve the problem is by taking it to the Lord. Unfortunately. So 35 years ago, friends of mine, one was a Dallas Seminary graduate, and the other was a business guy. And they were business doing business the other guy. And they got crosswalks. So they start buying the lawsuits. So I said, would you be willing to meet with someone? To, the business guy. He said, I'll meet with anybody from this guy's church. Anyway. So I got a guy named, uh, I got the chairman of the elder board, the Northwest Bible. Fred Sewell. To come and meet with these two men to help work through this. So, the, the two guys, the elder from this guy's church, and me. And so, try to talk through this. And the Dallas Seminary guy would not listen, would not respond. And this, I'm, I'm, this guy was, this elder was really animated and angry that uh, this person would just not listen. And he was just obviously engaged in thieving, so to speak. And he never responded right. The business guy, after a year or so of this, just said, I'm done. This is not part of the hassle and the emotion. And then a few years later, Dallas Seminary grad, who had done that and the other additional things that were evil, stuck a gun in his mouth. And him. So, uh, and that's real. But he would not listen. To someone from his church, the chairman of the elder board from his church, he wouldn't listen to that. So we tried that 
And then the other guy said, well, I'm not going to sue him because I, I don't need to be involved with this. I'm better for the whole thing. Don't you try to in relation to that 15, uh, you know, 15 to 18, uh, in my case, it says, <coughs> ask you to go to the time that is out of time. Then he wouldn't listen. And, and, <coughs> and anyway, the uh, same thing, a common so called suit is divorce. And I believe that we should try to work things out within the church, even on that, but most churches will not. And so they, they file papers, et cetera. And so we're out, you know, we can't blame the system. Be not, you know. So clearly, Paul's preference was keep it in the church, there's all this thing. And so from that, some will say, Christians should never sue another Christian. And others would say, Christians, if they tried everything else, it's not wrong to avail the law on the books to simply bring a person under the law that's on the books. What the Corinthians were doing was they were just manipulating weaker, poorer people, slapping up, you know, just stupid lawsuits, getting, you know, ruining the life and get whatever they could. So there was a really bad motive here. But is this a relevant deal in the church today in Dallas, Texas? And, and leadership needs to know how to think through this and apply. <coughs> well, what I was going to say is there are absolutely some principles. And what you're going over is a principle. And when you apply a principle to a situation, there are other principles that you need to take into account. And the DTS grad that was being dishonest should have gone to court to be held accountable for what he was doing. Because then he was able to go and mess up with somebody else. And that's why he made you go to court to stop him. But instead, he went on and did other things and ruined his family, <coughs> his wife, and his yeah. um, You said that the rapture was because of the trails and the God takes the Lord his home. That's one reason for the rapture. Is that one reason for the rapture? Yeah, yeah I think so. Yeah. Um, it seems, depending on how you look at Revelation 2 and 3 and the seven letters to the seven churches, and the last one is a church that's just totally been co opted by sin and whatever, and, uh, and totally out of fellowship with God. All seems to talk about in Second Corinthians in the end time, men will become lovers of pleasure, blah, 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 blah. So, Many people believe that as the church becomes inept, then the Lord will remove the church to get on to the next phase. The next phase is the judgment upon Israel, all that great tribulation, and amongst the pagans. But many, many people will become believers. They won't become Christians because the church will be removed, but they will become believers in Yahweh and allow them to be killed as well. Hey, you know, just, I'm just going to know. Somebody turned the heater on. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> That's the cue to go. So, yeah, we're going back to Rocky now. <laughs> Father in heaven, thank you for your word. And we pray that we would be wise to learn from what you have given to us. Pray for our church and our leadership that they would be wise to know these things, to Unfortunately, if they have to, to apply them to certain circumstances and situations. Lord, for us, help us to be wise, to understand truth. And especially, Lord, that when they are coming for us, and we are going to judge the world, and we are going to judge the angels, and we do have a future for us. So thank you for that. And pray that we would live today in light of that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.